So we're on to uh, English Renaissance, or the Elizabethan era, and I have um, Boddington's Pub Ale, a nice good English beer. So uh, looking at your board notes, uh, you see at the top of it you have Henry VIII and Catholicism. Now one of the things you have to understand about uh, the drama at this time, it was very closely linked with the politics. Uh, Henry VIII uh, broke from the Roman Catholic Church in 1534 because the uh, Pope wouldn't let him divorce his most recent wife. So he decided to create a whole new religion. Well, eh, sort of a new religion. It was still Christianity, but it was uh, the first... This is actually the beginnings of what was known as Protestantism. So any kind of Protestant religion stems from the Church of England, from Henry VIII doing this in uh, 1534. Um, then uh, after, at the end of his reign in 1547, uh, his son Edward reigned until 1553, in which case uh, he, he remained Protestant, but then his sister took it over in, uh, in 1553 to 1558, and that was Mary the first, uh, known as Bloody Mary because of the executions she did for uh, of the Protestants. And that then uh, ended up, because she, what she did is she, she was uh, came in and reinstated uh, Catholicism. So it was a big sort of civil war thing going on between Protestants and Catholics. So when she, her reign ended in uh, 1558, Elizabeth took over and reinstated Protestantism. Now, this is also, during this time, all of these um, church plays that we talked about in medieval era had been suppressed. And they were later outlawed during uh, Elizabeth's reign completely. So you, you just couldn't form those at all. So something had to take place. Something had to take its place. And the drama emerges really slowly out of the, from the medieval drama into the new drama in England around uh, the mid 16th century is when it really starts popping up. Um, so these dramas were typically produced in the colleges, uh, Eton and Cambridge and Oxford. And these were based on medieval farces and probably some of the, uh, the folklore, the mummers that we talked about in medieval era. And, um, but they were sort of a, using techniques of Roman drama because that's what they knew, that's what they had uh, um, translated at that point in time. So they sort of took the structure of the, of the Roman dramas and used their own storylines in them and that became sort of the new drama, which was acceptable to the, uh, to the crown because it wasn't the medieval uh, religious drama anymore. So these dramas become known as the Tudor dramas, T-U-D-O-R, mainly because of the fact that the royal line at that point in time was the Tudors, Henry Tudor, Elizabeth Tudor. So these are the Tudor dramas that you see in your, uh, right under Henry VIII and Catholicism in there. Some of these early ones were uh, Ralph Royster Doister, uh, written by Nicholas Udall, and that was about uh, 1534 to 1541, somewhere in that neighborhood. Uh, Gamma Girton's Needle is another one, written by, uh, all we know is, is a Mr. S. And uh, that was acted at Christ's College, actually, somewhere between 1552 and 1563. And then you have Damon and Pythias, uh, and that was written by Richard Edwards in 1564. Now that was the first English play with somewhat of a complex plot to it. So we're starting to see a, a progression of skill at this point in time, into the point where we finally reach uh, the first important English tragedy, written actually for uh, Elizabeth by Thomas Sackville and Thomas Norton in 1561, and that was called Gorboduc. Um, it was uh, written like a lot of the plays at that point in time, you're pulling material from English history, uh, but still uh, basing it in the classical drama in their structure. Um, so we start to see the beginnings of plays being written, so you're obviously you're going to have players who are playing them, and uh, the, the players under Elizabeth's realm in, in, in England at that time, the players and the Privy Council, sort of the, the government of London, always had a very strained relationship. And, and, and the Privy Council was not real fond of the fact that these people also tended in these new plays to throw sort of political commentary in there. So because of that, censorship became actually rather high um, in so far as the plays that were produced at that point in time. Now, there were two major types of playing spaces in Elizabethan England. 
and they were uh, outdoor types, which were arenas or vineyards, and indoor types, which were nobles' houses or manors or things uh, like that. Okay, where would I do that at? Oh, Some plays were performed okay, in private houses, okay, public okay, halls, um, and, but the inns okay. were, the, were sort of like the penultimate of, of where okay. to yeah. put on a play. Um, the reason is being because the fact that the inn provided food, drink, and even actually a place to stay for the for the actors if they needed it. Um, what they would do is, um, you see, this is where it's good in the face face class to have a board behind me. I can do drawings, but uh, if you imagine a square, um, the inns, the rooms that make up a square, and then there's a courtyard in the middle of it. So. All your rooms go along the, the, the sides of the square, and in the middle is a courtyard that's open air. They would erect a sort of a, a hastily put together wooden platform at one end of it, and that's where they perform, and everybody who wanted to watch the play would come out into the courtyard and stand around and watch the play. So this was the early okay. style of yep. staging plays outdoors in Elizabethan England. Um, Along around 1574, the city corporation starts to regulate the inns, which inns could provide this type of performance, and so on and so forth. There's not a lot of records about it as to the reasoning behind it, but you think about the fact that these people are uh, watching plays at inns where they're drinking, and um, most likely are looking at a lot of brawls uh, and uh, a lot of sort of lewd behavior. So they started to regulate the inyards to see which ones could uh, could perform, have performances at them and win. Um, and some of these inyards actually later were turned into permanent theaters. But uh, by 1575, the city authorities imposed code moving theaters out of the city. All right? This means that they had gotten out of hand. And they, even their regulations in 1575 could not keep them in check. So they start saying that any theaters that are going to be done need to be moved outside the city limits. Okay, um, This is probably one of the factors that led James Burbage in 1576 to build his theater across the Thames River in Finsbury Fields. And that was called The Theater. For the longest time, it has been considered the first theater built in Elizabethan England. But recently, they uncovered the foundations of one that they feel was, was built earlier. There's been, to my knowledge at least, there's been no conclusive evidence to this yet, to the point where they've had this groundbreaking, okay, this, was, this predates the theater, and there it is. Uh, but... Uh, so, for our purposes, we will still look at it as 1576, the theater built by James Burbage, the first theater, uh, permanent theater structure in Elizabethan England. Uh, and I've actually, I've, I've been to the site of the foundation of it in London, and uh, there's a pub over it right now, which I guess is sort of fitting. Um, and this was sort of a, a, it was a field, literally. It was just a, a, a open space, so it was plenty of room for theaters to start building up. Then in 1577, the Curtain, another theater, uh, was built in that same area in Finsbury Fields because it seemed to be a sort of a slowly evolving, kind of hopping theater place. Um, and around 10 years later, the success of those two theaters led to more permanent theaters being built, but they were ended up building back on the former side of the Thames over in Shoreditch area. Um, It's uh, the actual area that they would have been built, it would have been uh, Bankside. So, uh, which is where uh, the Globe Theater is also. And it uh, that became the new theater scene. The first one there built was in 1587, it was the Rose Theater. Uh, its foundations are still in existence, but they're underneath a building, like in a basement of a building that's usually flooded. So, you are got a plaque on the wall that says, this is the foundations of the Rose Theater, but you kind of have to know someone to go down in there and actually see the foundations that are sort of underwater a lot of the time. But it, it is still there. So the Rose Theater foundations are still about, uh, and that was built in 1587. And near that, in 1595, the Swan is built. 
and then the Globe Theater was built in 1599. Uh, 1600, the Fortune is built. And the Fortune is a pretty important one. When we talk about theater architecture, we'll talk about the Fortune Theater because uh, we actually have documents as to, as to dimensions and, and what it looked like. So, which would be cooler again if I could draw a picture of it, but I don't have a board like that. So, um, now. Looking at your uh, your notes uh, here, it says uh, 1596. James Burbage converts the Blackfriars Monastery for indoor theater. Monasteries were were used. I mean, monasteries that weren't being used still as a monastery were used as uh, indoor theater spaces during the winter months when it became too cold uh, or the weather was too inclement to continue doing outdoor theater. But uh, Burbage also used his uh, indoor theater, the Blackfriars. Uh, as a housing for his boy acting company. Uh, they were called Children of the Chapel. And we'll talk about this when we get into boy acting companies, but basically what it ends up being is women roles were played by boys. Well, they had to train these people. They couldn't just throw a Romeo, or I'm sorry, a Juliet or, a, uh, or an Ophelia on stage who had never been on stage before. So they had to train these kids. So these were the places, these were the schools effectively, where they would train the boys to act, and then they could go out and pull off a, a Juliet or a Ophelia or whatever. And uh, and this is why uh, James Burbage used that particular monastery. And of course, in, like I said, in the winter, their main shows would go in there as well. Uh, but in 1596, the uh, inn yards were pretty much closed down entirely. Um, the, the, there were several reasons for it in, in actuality. Um, the city corporation was actually trying to expel all the players out of London proper, which is kind of difficult because you've got several theaters already built on Bankside. They're not going anywhere. But uh, the, they closed the inyards, um, and uh, there was uh, one inyard specifically that the Shakespeare's company used to play at in the winter. Uh, it was called the Cross Keys Inn. So they. Uh, there were a few that were outside the city that were able to continue, uh, continue on. Um, 1597, Thomas Nash, Isle of Dogs. This is really, really very interesting and very exciting. Um, in 1597, a guy by the name of Thomas Nash, and apparently assisted by the playwright Ben Johnson, wrote a play called Isle of Dogs. Apparently it was so seditious that Ben Johnson was arrested. The lead actor, Gabriel Spencer, was arrested. Thomas Nash was supposed to be arrested, but he escaped. It was so bad, not bad as in like a bad play, but it was so horrendous against the government that uh, the theater, uh, the city council, uh, the corporation pretty much um, eliminated all theater. All theater was abolished, and they actually had in the in the writings for this uh, order, this decree, they requested tearing down the curtain and the theater. So Thomas Nash writes a play that is so offensive to the crown that it kills theater entirely and makes them want to tear down these two theaters. Now, they never got around to tearing down the two theaters, mind you, but that's how bad it was. Um, oddly enough, Gabriel Spencer and Ben Johnson were in the same cell for a while and spent a good few months at least in, the, in prison together and ended up uh, later on in a duel where Ben Johnson yeah. killed Gabriel Spencer. Kind of bizarre. Anyway, more information you don't really need to know in your life, but there it is. So, um, moving on down to uh, the next thing here, uh, 1598, the, the theater's lease runs out. Now, this is a really interesting story. Okay, um, James Burbage had passed away. 1597, he died. The lease was up for the theater. Now, the lease basically stated that as long as the theater was removed from the land at the end of the lease, it still belonged yeah. to the Burbages. But if it was left there at the end of the lease, then of course it would belong to the leaseholder. So what this guy did is he kept putting off renewing the lease. Richard Burbage, James's son, and Cuthbert Burbage, his brother, 
kept trying to renew the lease, and the and the, uh, the owner oh, wouldn't, really? the landowner wouldn't do it. He would say, "Oh, yeah, we'll do that later. Oh, yeah, yeah we'll do that later." All right? And then he took holiday right at the end of December, fifteen ninety seven, so that the lease would run out. Yeah. And then, of course, when he came home, he'd have a brand new theater all to his own. Well, not brand new, but he'd have a theater all to his own. Uh, because that's what happens when the lease runs out and it's still on his land. So while he was off on holiday, one night, Richard Burbage calls a carpenter by the name of Peter Street to come in and loosen the pegs in the uh, joints of the building. Mind you, they still had some performances to do. Uh, so he just started loosened about half of them. And... Um, uh, mortise and tendon joints, if you're not familiar with them, it's a, it's a joint like this and then the other piece goes into it like that and then they drill a hole in the center of it here and put a peg through, right? And it swells and it holds and it's a very good joint. So he knocks those pegs out so that they're just kind of holding in here now for about half the pegs in there. After their last performances, they knock out all the rest, they tear the entire building down in one night, carry it across the Thames River and rebuild the theater on Bankside in 1599, and that is known as the Bull. So, that is uh, how the Globe Theater came into being, is uh, they lost their lease over on Finsbury Fields. Which obviously takes us down to our next section there. Uh, you see also it says Burns in 1613, rebuilt in 1614, and uh, torn down during 1644. Well, the Globe Theater, uh, in a performance of Henry the Eighth, I believe it is, um, they have an artillery shop, and the king enters you know, to fire the cannons. Now these roofs are made of thatch. They fired a cannon. A wadding of it hit the thatched roof, started burning, burned down the entire theater. They had time enough to get all the costumes, properties, and actually, luckily, all of Shakespeare's plays out of the building before it burned down. They actually were even capable of getting everybody out of the theater. One account that I know says it burned to the ground within an hour. I can't possibly imagine that. That can't be a, a day I would accept, you know, because this is good, solid, and really old by now, English oak that they're using for these things. That does not burn fast. And, and it's a little more evidenced by the fact that these things could seat, and we'll talk about it in a little bit, these things could seat up to 3,000 people. Getting 3,000 people safely out of there in an hour would be amazing. And it said that absolutely, no, the record I read said no one was hurt, one man's pants caught on fire, but it was put out by a bottle of beer. Resourceful people they are. So, that's what happened as far as it burning down in 1613. It was rebuilt in 1614, which would be Globe 2. And that was torn down by Puritans in 1644 uh, after Charles I was beheaded and we lost the Civil, they lost the Civil War. Well, uh, we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that when we get to the decline of, the, of English Renaissance theater. But So now the Globe 2 has been dismantled by 1644 and is no longer in existence. Rebuilt in 1998 by, actually an American was behind it, uh, Sam Wanamaker, and uh, he pushed for a rebuilding of the Globe Theater, which is the Globe 3, and that's what is still in existence in London today. If you haven't had a chance to be there and, and, and go in it and see it, you should try to make that trip sometime. It's pretty amazing. Uh, so in 1600, the fortune is built. Um, now, the fortune's built on Bankside, and we'll talk about it a little more when we get into theater architecture. But like I said, it's important. 1600 to 1605, somewhere in that neighborhood, the Red Bull is built on Bankside also. And the Red Bull is one of those theaters that is also used for, and many of these other theaters were also used for, uh, bear baiting, cockfighting, uh, and uh, uh, prize matches. Uh, if you don't know what those are, uh, bear baiting is where they put a, a leg iron around uh, one leg of a bear and put a pin in the ground so it holds it in place. And then they let loose a few dogs on it and see who wins. Cockpit, cockfighting is... Uh, uh, obviously where the two roosters go at it. Um, and um, places where that was normally done were places called called cockpit. And you'll see that at reference every so often in Shakespeare's plays. Uh, I think I've got a reference over here and I'll, I'll probably read it uh, because it connects to the architecture and whatnot. 
Uh, and then, of course, prize masters are where fencers, when they are, are fighting for their title of either provost or, or maestro, uh, they have to fight certain people in order to get that prize. Well, they would actually do this on stage in front of an audience. So uh, that's what theaters were also used for, and it was well known that they were used for that. Um, Boy acting companies. Now, we talked a little bit about that already, so let me just hit on it a little more. The boy acting companies were common in most of your acting troops because they had to train young boys to become their leading actors for the female roles. They would start usually around the age of six or so, an apprentice under one of the lead actors, and, uh, and then they would learn how to act till about 14. So... By that time, they were ready to take on roles of Juliet, Ophelia, Lady Macbeth, so on and so forth. And uh, this particular company that, that uh, Burbage had, the Children of the Chapel, was at the Blackfriars. The Blackfriars seated, uh, I think, something around 700 spectators, somewhere in that neighborhood. Um, and it was used primarily for that, as well as their wintering, like I said. Um, the, the kids would give, the boy acting company would give regular performances there, so it was kind of like a children's theater, I guess, if you will, uh, where they would get to do their own productions. Right? Um, but right around, right around 1608, they started uh, suppressing the children's, the, the, the boy acting companies. And uh, I, I don't know the exact reason why, other than the possibility that, that they started to believe that they were starting to train children in something that is not really considered an, a viable profession, so they were kind of uh, not doing very well by the children by getting them into these professions. Uh, matter of fact, by this point in time, to be honest, you could not actually list yourself as actor or playwright or anything along the lines of theater as a profession. Everybody had to be listed as a profession, you know, uh, and so if the, the crown or the government came to you and said, what is your profession? you could not say actor. You had to say something else. Uh, I believe Shakespeare was Glover because that's what his father was. Um, ben Johnson's stepfather was a bricklayer, so his profession was bricklayer. Matter of fact, in the, uh, the legal document about his murder of Gabriel Spencer, it lists him as Ben Johnson bricklayer. So all of these people had a profession that they had to put down uh, officially that was not actor. Uh, and mind you, that's where a lot of the last names come from in England, uh, from the medieval era of, oh, my, I am John and I'm the Fletcher, so your name becomes John Fletcher or John Cooper, who makes barrels, or John Glover, or so on and so forth. So that's where a lot of the last names come from, is, is their profession what they did. And you still had to do this, even into the Renaissance, uh, into the 1600s, you still had to list a profession that was not acting. So, um, they started suppressing these companies in 1608, the children's companies. And uh, the Blackfriars pretty much just became the winter home of Shakespeare's, well, it's Burbage's actually a troupe, but this troupe we know connected with Shakespeare became their winter home after the suppression of the children's companies. All right, so now we get to architecture. And you see there it says polygonal or rectangular structures seating 1,500 to 3,000. Um, what you need to understand is that British architecture, any, any architecture really at this particular point in time, um, actual circles were not possible. So though the globe looks like it's circular, it really is 20 to 24 sides, I think 22 to 24 sides. So it's polygonal, it's multi-sided, but it's enough to the point where it ends up looking round. So most of your permanent theater structures were either square or rectangular or polygonal so that they looked circular. A lot of your bear baiting and those kind of things were uh, polygonal so that they looked circular. They seated around 1,500 to 3,000 people. Um, so, and I said we talk about the Fortune Theater when we got to this point because it's really important. And I have a document up here uh, on my laptop that um, is the actual wording description of the Fortune Theater. So I'm going to read it and we'll kind of parcel it out. It says, the frame of the said house to be set square and to contain four score of lawful assize every way square 
without and 55 foot of like a size square every way within. So now what that means is on the outside of the building, it's four square every way. So now this is a complete square, or four score, excuse me. It's a complete square. Four score is 80. The score being 20, so it's now 80. Now it tells us it's 80 feet from outside wall to outside wall on both sides. So it's a complete square. And it's 55 feet like a size everywhere within. So you've got outside wall 80 feet, 25 feet of seating area, covered seating area. And then the inside sort of uh, groundling area, which would have likened itself to uh, the courtyard in the inyards, that open air area, that's 55 feet. So, and it says a stage and tiring house to be made, erected and set up within the said frame with a shadow or cover over the said stage, which stage shall be placed and set in such sort as is prefigured in a plot thereof drawn. So, they're talking about a stage. Just like the little hastily put together stages, makeshift platforms that they would have done in the inyards, they did here, but it was obviously permanent, and so it was a little more sound. And it was covered partially by a roof. So, in some instances, if they're back far enough upstage, and it was raining, the actors wouldn't get wet. But there's still an area of the stage known as the apron that the actors could still be being doused just like the groundlings in the rice when it was raining. That uh, says, a stage shall contain in length 43, 40 and 3 foot of lawful a size and in breadth to extend to the middle of the yard of the said house. So, 43 feet wide which means there's six feet on either side before it hits the sides of the, uh, of the theater, or of, the, of the seating area. And it comes out halfway into, this, into the stage area, so that makes it uh, 27 and a half feet deep. 27 and a half feet deep by 43 wide. Kind of close to Dart Auditorium area uh, without the apron on it. So that tells us a lot about that physical structure of the Fortune Theater. And a lot of them were very similar. So now we get a general idea of, of those types of theaters. Shakespeare actually even writes uh, a little bit about the theaters occasionally in some of his plays. In the prologue to Henry V, uh, he writes, Pardon, gentles all, the flat, unraised spirits that hath dared on this unworthy scaffold to bring forth so great an object. Can this cockpit hold the vasty fields of France? Or may we cram within this wooden O the very casks that did affright the air at Agincourt. The cockpit he's talking about there is the fact that many of these theaters were used also as cockfighting. And the wooden O is what he's talking about with the, uh, the sort of circular look of a lot of these stages. Right? When he says unworthy scaffold, he's making a reference to the staging area because it used to be very hastily put together in the inyards. So it was pretty much sort of a scaffold. Uh, so it gives us a lot to go by in that regard. Now, the area that was open air was the place for the groundlings. The groundlings were people who pretty much could only afford the barest entrance fee, which would be one penny. Now, one penny at this particular point in time was pretty much of man's daily wage. So you got to look at it from this perspective. Look at us now. You're looking at minimum wage at thereabouts eight dollars an hour, I'm guessing, roughly. So eight hour day, sixty four dollars. You're looking at somewhere in the neighborhood of a fifty dollar ticket, which is kind of similar to what Broadway is. So eh, not terribly off, all right. But the groundlings would pay one penny to stand and watch the show the entire time, right up to the front of the stage, even though you know and. Uh, and that was all the same price. Then you start getting into the galleries, which are these covered seating areas there. Then you hit the two penny and the three penny and so on and so forth, right? Um, and that was how they priced all these. They just sort of went up by a penny each, each way that they went. Um, and th those are the galleries, those seating areas that were covered are, are called the galleries. Now, on the stage, you typically had a, a back wall here, so the stage jutted out in the, into the uh, tire, into the, the uh, groundling area. And at the back of there was a tiring house, and that was uh, had, had a sort of a, a flat wall structure, kind of like the old skinny fronds. And there was two doors in it, 
and in the middle of it was an opening that was curtained off. So that was uh, called the inner below. You can go in and out of it. Now these were two stories, typically. At least two stories. Sometimes they were a third and there were musicians that were playing out of a, a small sort of a balcony area of the very top of it. But there are usually at least two stories. And the second story would obviously not have two doors on either side, but it would still have another curtained area in the center, known as the inner above, that would show a balcony from that. Uh, you can see all this in the pictures that you see uh, on uh, the pictures I set up on there on D2L. So that is your inner above and your inner below. Um, the heavens, at least in the Globe Theater, were underneath the roof that I told you that goes out across over the stage area. Up underneath it was painted this wonderful sort of zodiac, astrological, basically the heavens. Uh, and it was it's pretty incredible. And it's, uh, it's painted the way in the, in the current one as well. Usually in the, about the center of the, of the roof, and it was so in, in the globe as well, in the heavens. The center one was sort of a trap door in which they could actually send people down, flying down, well, flying down, right, uh, into the, the staging area. So they had means and, and machines into which they could fly people in and out through that one trap door. And they had at least one trap door or so in the floor where people could get out underneath there and then crawl under the stage all the way back to the tiring house. That's um, Performances were typically at 3 o'clock in the summer and 2 o'clock in the winter. And the reason they were at 2 o'clock in the winter is because even at 2 o'clock, a show that's lasting upwards of three hours, is still going to be dark and cold by the time you're done. So they had to be done earlier. Uh, let's see. Now the fact that they didn't really have lighting or uh, any kind of uh, scenery on these stages, they're, they're pretty much bare, is one of the reasons why you'll find if you read Shakespearean dramas, quite often actors will come in and they'll describe what time of day it is or where they are, right? Why do they give a description? Well, we would just put the lighting and the setup there and you wouldn't have to have that description in there. But they didn't have that. So they would come out and say, uh, oh, you know, it is very dark out this evening uh, in, in Arden Wood or whatever. And so now the audience knows, okay, it's nighttime and we're in the woods. Because they didn't have set pieces. Um, so we're moving on to playwrights. And the first player we have here is Thomas Kidd. Now, Thomas Kidd is an important playwright because he actually demonstrated how to construct a well-articulated plot. And his one of the plays he's most well-known for is called The Spanish Tragedy, written in 1587. Don't mistake The Spanish Tragedy for being Spanish Renaissance. It isn't. It's Thomas Kidd. So, there's that. Christopher Marlowe it was a contemporary of Shakespeare's, uh, died in a pub with a knife in his eye. Shit happens. There's a longer story about that, but you should come and sit with me at the pub sometime and I'll tell you how it's all about. But anyway, he demonstrated how to construct uh, a coherent story out of sort of diverse historical events. Like take all these various historical events and put it into some kind of coherent story that, that chronologically flowed well. And that was his, his uh, big gift to the writers of that time that Shakespeare ate up and he followed right along with. He also perfected blank verse, which is verse drama, but not necessarily rhyming. As a medium for drama, his Dr. Faustus uh, and Edward II were uh, two of his, his serious masterpieces. Faustus was 1588 and Edward II was 1592. Then we get to William Shakespeare. William Shakespeare, uh, probably the greatest dramatist of all time. Uh, said to have written 38 plays. Actually, it's more like 39 now because Arden Shakespeare finally agreed that a recent uh, finding, that's not recent actually, they, they've known about it since the 1700s. They actually produced it in the 1700s several times. But it was um, a play called Double Falsehood or The Distressed Lovers, supposedly based uh, as, a, as a reworking of Shakespeare's play Cardinio. No copy of Cardinio exists, but this is enough of it for the Arden Shakespeare to say, okay, double falsehood is a Shakespeare drama. So there is now a 39. 
Um, and that, however, was not in the first folio, which we're talking about next here. The first folio is Shakespeare's entire canon and, uh, and his poems, all compiled by two of the actors in the company, John Heminge and Henry Condell. Heminge was the business manager for the company, also one of the actors, and um, supposedly the theory is that uh, Heminge actually created the role of Falstaff, not as far as writing it, but he was the one that played it first and sort of made that uh, him such a famous character, uh, definitely a favorite of Elizabeth's. Um, and Henry Condell joined about the same time as Shakespeare, and uh, he uh, he was a sharer in the company. We'll talk about sharers a little bit later on. But he worked with Heminge on uh, getting the first folio put together and, and published in 1623. By the way, in case you want to know when the first folio was published, and then we have Ben Johnson. Killed a man in a duel. Got off on it by pleading uh, something about uh, the right of the clergy. Because he could read and write. So he actually got away with murder. Kind of strange, but that's what happened. Uh, his thumb was branded with a T, and that was about the extent of it. I believe he probably had to pay the family some sort of restitution, but that was really all they got out of it. Uh, he became a very well-known writer of court masks, which we'll talk about a little bit later, and uh, was most well-known for what were called comedies of humors. Humors are uh, fluids in the body that they felt dictated our personalities. So there's blood, yellow bile, black bile, and phlegm. And uh, like if you have two, if your blood's too hot, you're, you're a sanguine character uh, who's, who's angry and hot all the time. Um, so that was their sort of concept these various fluids in the body and their uh, whether they're in a proper proportion or in proportion uh, gives you the idea of what kind of character it's going to be, what kind of personality they're going to have and John, uh, Ben Johnson used those extensively in his works uh, The Alchemist is one of his plays Every Man in His Humor is one of his plays so uh, definitely the best writer next to Shakespeare in English drama Okay, looking at acting troops. Uh, okay, and it says gentlemen there right away. It doesn't mean actors were gentlemen, they were not. What it means is that at first any gentleman could support an acting troupe. Now, what is a gentleman? Well, a gentleman in England is anybody who owns land. This became a bit unwieldy because acting troops would pop up, and when asked by the, the Privy Council, well, who, who's your sponsor? Well, they would just uh, pull a name out of their ass. Uh, you know, John Fletcher is my sponsor. Gentleman Fletcher. And they'd go, oh, okay, because they don't have a record of every gentleman. So this became troublesome, and there were people running around all over the place. It was, you know, you might find out in a pub some night, oh, I have an acting troupe. I never heard of it, all right? So they dealt with it by switching in 1572. Elizabeth uh, made it such that no one lower than a baron was allowed to maintain an acting troupe. Now, there was a law actually passed prior to this in 1559 where Elizabeth forbade any unlicensed works to be performed. And uh, no plays on religious or political subjects, really censored. And uh, what she ended up doing is making local officials, sheriffs, and so on and so forth responsible for these public performances. And that didn't really solve the problem of all of these acting troops popping up and, and doing whatever they felt like. All right, so we're going to we're seeing the beginnings of the creation of the office of the Master of Rebels. And the off, Master of Rebels already existed in the court. He took care of the entertainment for the court. But the office of, of the Master of Rebels is going to start working on public entertainment after all this doesn't work. All the things that she tries to do to keep people in check doesn't work. She has to turn to the Master of Rebels and say, you need to control entertainment in the public. That happens in 1574. Master of Rebels, who was in charge of all the monarch's entertainment, now all of a sudden is put in charge of a true of a, was one specific troop, Leicester's men, and that was Burbage's troop before he became the Lord Chamberlain's men and later the King's men. This was before Shakespeare joined him. Uh, Leicester's men, Burbage's troop, had a, was the first royal patent 
And so the queen said, all right, you're master of rebels, you're now in charge of their works. And by 1581, she expanded it out to all acting troops that existed. And then by 1598, she expanded it to not only all the troops, but all the playhouses, everything. Everything came under his control. Any play that was going to be performed, any play that was going to be published, all came under his control by 1598. That was the office of the Master of Rebels. Again, still didn't necessarily solve the problem of sort of random troops. So, after Elizabeth dies and James I takes the throne in 1603, James comes in and says, all right, it's got to be a member of the royal family to support an acting troop. Any other troop that does not have a royal family patronage is not a legal troop. It's easier. You know the royal family. They're all there. So nobody can claim that, that they've got a patronage when they don't. And James I took Lord Chamberlain's men, which was Shakespeare and Richard Burbage's troop, as his, and they became the King's men in 1603, given the titles Gentlemen of the Chamber. So they actually had titles. Should give you the option. If not, don't worry about it. Now, costumes were pretty much their own clothes, unless they were playing a woman. Uh, or playing uh, some sort of a historical or bad character. Um, black was usually worn for characters of Moors or, or, or evil characters. Um, women were not allowed to perform on stage, we've discussed that. And uh, boys played their roles, and they were apprenticed to do so. Costumes and scenery is next on your list. Or, I'm, I'm sorry, no, uh, repertory is next on your list. Here. Actors had to learn lines from several different shows because they would typically do two to three performances or two to three productions, different shows per week. That's we call that repertory theater now, where you do you learn like five, four or five shows, and then throughout the week you just rotate what show you're doing, right? And uh, that's what they did. That was how they kept the audiences coming. They didn't do shows like kind of we do on Broadway. It's like well, for the next six weeks it's going to be Hamlet. No, it was Hamlet Monday night. Uh, perhaps uh, Romeo and Juliet the second night, and so on and so forth, like three or four of them, and then they'd rotate it. So maybe by Friday, Hamlet would be back again. Um, looking at the Lord's Chamberlain's men, we kind of already talked about this uh, to a small degree at least, and that is that um, I'm going to try to run it through real quick for you. Uh, there was a company of players that were known as the Hunsdon's men because they were. Uh, sponsored by Lord Carey and he was then promoted to the office of Lord Chamberlain so they became the Lord Chamberlain's men in 1590 theaters closed due to plague in 1592 to 1594 so they hopped around a bit a lot of those theaters went a lot of those players those troops went to Germany right across the English Channel into Germany and played there, and that was the basis of German Renaissance theater. We're not actually going to get into German Renaissance theater in this class because there's not enough of it, really. But that was pretty much the, the, the influence, and why Shakespeare is still so important in Germany today is because all these sort of English troops came over and started doing Shakespearean works and other works in Germany, and that's the only theater they really didn't have. Very little theater otherwise, other than court theater, right? Uh, so when they came back after 1594, um, then they became the Hunston's men again because Lord Hunston died and his son took them back over and uh, he was not the Lord Chamberlain. But he later gets the title as Lord Chamberlain again, so they become Lord Chamberlain's men again. Uh, at one point in time they were absorbed in the company of the Queen's men, which uh, dies out in 1588, so they go back to being the Lord Chamberlain's men. So, again, it's very convoluted and very back and forth, and it's not really what you need to, to remember about this. The most important thing about this is that the Lord Chamberlain's men was the company that Shakespeare was most intimately connected with. It was Burbage's and Shakespeare's troupe, and it later becomes, in 1603, the King's men. That's what you need to know about that. Looking at court masks, remember I talked about the intermezzi in, Ingl in, uh, uh, in Italy. These are basically the same thing as the intermezzi in, in Italy. They're called court masks. They're shows at court, very intricate, lavish costumes and scenery, just like in Italy, quite often connected to the people in the court that are being honored at the time. 
put between acts of plays, that's what court masks are. The principal designer for the court masks was a man named Inigo Jones, who studied in Italy. That's why he's a principal designer, because he could bring Italianate scenery to it. Principal writer for it was Ben Johnson. Yes. Closing of the theaters, 1642, the Puritans close all down, close down all the theaters because they feel that they are immoral and they spread disease because there's 3,000 people packed in a relatively small area, about a hundred foot diameter, right? 3,000 people packed in there uh, and they don't bathe too well, too often, right? And, uh, and disease is spread. So I, I can't argue with that, but it still wasn't very cool. So they, they pushed to close down the theaters. Um, now, you, you need to understand also that the reason the Puritans were capable of doing this is because of the Civil War. Charles I ruled Parliament, uh, ruled, I'm sorry, ruled uh, England without Parliament from 1629 to 1640. He didn't care, didn't talk to him, didn't give him any say. Then all of a sudden he had to come to them for money because they needed money for some war that he was attempting to do. And uh, Parliament said, you know what, we're not going to authorize any new taxes or anything until you start giving us some power. And Charles I said, it's off, not going to happen. So then they broke from him. Now there's the royalty and then there's the people. This was led uh, in... This actually really led to uh, the sort of end of the Renaissance in England. Um, Charles was defeated, and uh, the Civil War began in 1642, and in 1649, Charles I was beheaded. So by 1649, Oliver Cromwell was in charge of England, and the Puritans were in charge of the government. They closed down the theater in 1642. Now, the way they did it was this. As soon as the Civil War started in 1642, the Puritans came to the theaters and said, uh, we're going to close this down just for a few years until all of this heat dies down. And the theaters went, oh, that sounds fine to us. Because they had a good feeling that they were going to win the Civil War. And once they won the Civil War, they could make that closing permanent. And that is exactly what they did until the Restoration in 1660, the return of Charles II to the throne, which is why it's called the Restoration. There it is, and that is the end of English Renaissance.